Today on episode 97, I'm bringing to you what so many of you have burning questions about, information about special ed students. We will all have special ed or SPED students at some point in our classrooms, and we often feel lost in terms of how to support them. So I brought on a special education expert, Brandy Rosen, and we discuss all things SPED. We covered so much that this is actually split into two episodes. The first one is from a general ed teacher's perspective, and then next week's episode, episode 98, will be through the lens of a SPED teacher. Welcome to the Teachers Need Teachers podcast, where we help new and beginning teachers navigate through those crazy first years of teaching so you can maintain your sanity and personal life. Here's your host, Kim LaPree. Welcome to the Teachers Need Teachers podcast, a proud member of the Education Podcast Network. I'm your host, Kim LaPree, and this is the podcast for new and beginning teachers who don't want to just survive those first few years, but actually thrive. Hey there, thank you so much for hanging out with me today. I'm so excited about today's episode because I brought on someone who not only knows so much about SPED, but she also coaches new teachers as well. And if I sound a little bit different today, it's because it's this time of year in 2020. Um, it's January and me and the rest of the world seems to be getting sick. Still. So I'm at the tail end of, I don't know if it was the flu or maybe it was just the nastiest cold ever. But if I sound different today, I still haven't recovered from that. But I still wanted to show up for you regardless. <laughs> So we're getting closer to the new Educator Weekend North in Santa Clara, California from February 21st to the 23rd. And you know, this only happens twice a year, once in February and once in December. So you don't want to miss out on this conference or you're going to have to wait again until December. So be sure to head over to teachersneedteachers.com forward slash conference to sign up. Hey, y'all. I'm Casey Bell of the Google Teacher Tribe podcast, a proud member of the Education Podcast Network, just like the show you're listening to right now. The opinions expressed are those of the individual hosts. Make sure you check out all the other great podcasts at edupodcastnetwork.com and get ready because the learning begins in three, two, one. I met Brandy Rosen at the New Educator Conference South in San Diego, and after talking for a bit, I knew that I had to get her on the show. While I have personally worked with so many SPED students in my classrooms, I really wanted to bring you the perspective of someone who can give all of us gen ed teachers actionable strategies to accommodate for all learners. Well, Brandy, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I really appreciate you taking the time to do this. Absolutely. I'm happy to be here. Now, can you tell my audience about your teaching experience and how you came to your current position? Sure. Um, I started teaching in special education um, about almost 30 years ago now. Um, and I had actually gotten there kind of a, a funny way. I went into social work um, and then I decided that I really wanted to be able to connect with kids for a, a longer period of time. So I went and um, got my credential and I started teaching special education with emos emotionally disturbed kids um, at out of state, out of California, and um, eventually just um, moved to California, moved into some different positions teaching, and then I um, was really lucky enough to start with the district and help develop their behavior program in the district, and moved into a few different roles kind of through those years. And then um, about three or four years ago, I had been doing a lot of coaching um, for teachers. And I really wanted to focus a little bit more on that because I was seeing that, especially with new teachers, that there was just, um, there was so much missing in how much support they had and that they, you know, the teachers are sort of put in this position that no other profession really is where they're, um, they get out of school one day and the next day they're in charge of an entire class. And, and the expectation is that they can do it without too much support. And I just thought, wow, that's, it's, it's, 
teachers are struggling and um, we're losing a lot of teachers because they get burnt out and it's just too much to handle. But that when they have the right support, then they become these really great teachers. So that's kind of how I moved into doing consulting and training for teachers. And then I always wonder, you know, when when people are picking their different specialties. What what about special ed drew you to that particular focus? Like I know you had the social work, but why special ed? Um, you know, it's one of those stories, uh, of course, that a lot of people have is that I, I worked with a, a child in the social work setting and, um, he had a lot of emotional issues and, you know, just a lot of issues in his life. And I fell in love with him and I fell in love with what I felt like could be done for these kids. And so I really got into special education primarily to work with students with, um, emotional issues and autism, because that was really my passion, not really, uh, even knowing that much about kind of the rest of the world of special education. Um, and so that was kind of what drew me into that field. Um, and then it, I am definitely one of those that the minute I got there, I, I knew I had landed where I was supposed to land. Um, you know, I love special education. I love being able to see just the really small growth and the, um, you know, just to be able to really work with families and schools and get excited about everything that's possible for these kids. Well, I'm super excited to have an expert on here because my audience, regardless of whether or not they are special ed teachers, they all need information about special ed. And are you okay if I abbreviate it with SPED? Yeah. Okay. Course. So I want to look at SPED from both a Jenna ed teacher's point of view and mm -hmm. also from a SPED teacher's perspective. So first, I'm going to start out with Gen Ed. For brand new teachers, they probably had a few required classes pertaining to SPED. And, you know, maybe their first teaching assignment involves a few students with IEPs. What should they expect? Um, well, it's a great question. And I think that over the last few years, I have seen um, so much more interest from general ed teachers to help uh, support and understand special ed, because I think um, the there is, there's no school year anymore where a general ed teacher doesn't have some special ed kids in their classroom. And so it becomes kind of their priority right away because it's definitely the one thing they feel like they didn't get enough training in. Um, and so I think that one of the things that is really helpful for new teachers is to first of all kind of take a breath and to understand that it's okay that they don't understand and that um, that they're not special ed teachers so they need to reach out for the right support so that they can understand it. Um, I think that the two pieces that they that teachers have the most challenge with is meeting accommodations in the classroom um, and understanding kind of how to teach in that way and then the behavior which probably Probably, you know, comes up as the, the top concern across the board is that, you know, oftentimes kids with special needs come with some behaviors as well. So um, I think that that reaching out piece is really, really critical and um, just kind of having patience to learn what they need to know as far as practical implementation, um, I think your your most powerful tool for behavior is going to be setting up a really strong reinforcement system for your whole class and setting up strong procedures and rules um, because all kids benefit from that, but especially uh, kids with special needs. And then really um, collaborating with your team at the school site to find out what you need to be doing, double checking, making sure that that line of communication is really open. So you touched on my next thought here. So how should a Jenna teacher set up their classroom in terms of like their lessons, transitions, activities, rules, all of that so that they can accommodate their SPED students? Like I know good teaching is good teaching, but at the same time, they want, I feel like they need to be considerate so that they can set up the SPED students with things like behavior issues up for success. Uh, exactly. I mean, first off, right, good teaching is good teaching. And when you walk into a classroom where they're, they're kind of doing all the quote unquote good teaching things, then SPED kids often do really well in those classes. Um, but a couple, I think, tricks along the way are one is um, structure. 
that's going to be a big one. And oftentimes that's hard, especially for new teachers, because they're just trying to find their way through. Um, but the more structured the day is, the more structured the classroom setting is, the better off that the oftentimes kids with special needs will do in that classroom. Um, if there's a lot of clutter, if it's unclear, like where people need to be and when they need to be there, that's going to be really hard for them. Um, the other piece is the, like I said, a reinforcement system and really setting that up from the get go. And the reason that's so important is it's important for all kids. But if you set up a really strong reinforcement system, and again, it doesn't need to be complicated, but just a strong reinforcement system, then you're really able to um use that for your whole class, but at the same time, then you can change it up for the kids with special needs to make it work for them without really having them stand out so much. Um, and because the third thing I was going to say is really working on building that sense of community in the class, which includes all kids so that, um, the, you know, the typically developing kids are accepting of the kids with special needs and the special needs kids feel really a part of the classroom, not kind of this, you know, extra group off to the side, but that they're a, an active, important part of the classroom. Um, so, you know, kind of those three focuses are going to, you're going to get a lot of bang for your buck that way. Do you have any suggestions or examples of good behavior systems that you've seen implemented that really work for SPED kids? Yeah. I mean, I think the, the critical piece is that they're very concrete and specific. So what I see um, people struggle with is kind of focusing on what behavior they want to be um, the target behaviors. So for example, sometimes I'll see a teacher um, set up a behavior system around um, being nice or being a good student. And that's where they often will fall into trouble because it's just not clear enough um, for kids to understand what it is that teacher is looking for. So the best systems are really, really simple. I always encourage general ed teachers when I work with them to pick something that works for them. So either that can be stickers, it can be um, check marks, it can be, um, you know, marbles in a jar, um, whatever works for them, particularly they should use. Um, so that's kind of the first spot that they want to look at is what works for me, what, what feels like I can actually do it. Um, the second piece is being really, really clear on what it is that the students are working for. And I encourage, especially, um, in elementary to look at one to two kinds of skills that they'd be working on at a time, because any more than that, and it's really just too hard for kids to keep up with. And even once you go to the upper grades, um, three or four is really probably the top amount. So it might be something like, um, entering the room quietly, raising your hand when you have a question and sharing supplies, so those might be the focus because the teacher has determined those are the things that are really important to them. And then the students need to be reinforced at a really high rate for doing that. Um, and, and that's really the place to start because that's what's really going to make a difference for kids who have any sort of kind of learning difference, whether they be special ed or general ed. Now, you had touched on this, you know, how a lot of times when we think of SPED, we think of behavior problems, but not necessarily. I, I feel like it's it's a little bit of a stereotype. Mm -hmm. And so why why do why do you think teachers see SPED students as particularly having behavior problems maybe that are above and beyond what the average student has? And do you find this to be accurate? Well I think that I mean from you know, the obvious answer to that is behavior is the most interfering. So that's going to be that draw. That's going to be the thing that draws their attention. Um, the kids with behavior issues are the kids that um, teachers talk about. They know they're coming. There's a lot of um, there's a lot of noise around those kids. So I think that's why they draw so much attention. And the other big piece that um, I'm finding is, is really important to understand is that I think behavior is the area that many general ed teachers feel the least qualified to work with. Mm -hmm. And so that is, that's their, that's their weakness. And so they're most uncomfortable. If you have a student that comes in and they have learning differences, most teachers 
are kind of comfortable with that to some degree because their trainings in curriculum, their trainings in differentiation, they, they understand that and it's not so scary to them. But you have a kid who comes in and they have a lot of behaviors and they just haven't received the training and that they don't know how to do what needs to be done. So I think they immediately go to a place of, I can't do this, this student it shouldn't be in my class. But I truly believe a lot of times that comes from a place of just not feeling like they have the tools to be able to deal with them. Is this something where like behavior modification would come in? You mean teaching teachers that? Yeah, like teaching them skills so that they can yeah. help the student for sure you know, refocus or or teaching them how they're supposed to behave, basically. Absolutely. I think that, and, and I do a lot of trainings for general ed um, groups. And that's really what I do is I go back and I just kind of teach those skills. Um, I, I think that, you know, general ed programs do an amazing job teaching teachers how to teach curriculum and special ed programs do a really good job of teaching teachers how to teach behavior, work with behavior, but they don't cross over enough. And so um, the general ed teachers often don't leave a program with a lot of experience or practice doing that. Um, really, when I work with general ed teachers, I really take it back to the basics and teach them the basics of behavior, the basics of reinforcement, and then support them in the idea that they can personalize that information to make it something that works in their classroom, that it doesn't have to take all of their time. And that um, just a little change gets a lot of results. It's one of the the big pieces that I work with teachers on is that idea that you can't do everything. There's no question about that. But if you do something, you'll get some change. So, you know, if you have a student where you feel like 60% of your day is taken up dealing with their behavior and you do something small that brings that down to 30%, you've just freed up a lot of your time. So, um, you know, kind of empowering teachers with that idea that it's possible, they can learn it and they're still able to be the teachers that they want to be on top of that. Now, a behavior that I saw that wasn't necessarily disruptive um, was a student who just sat there and mm -hmm. blanked out. And mm -hmm. so, you know, I know that new teachers, a lot of times they're going to come by, they're going to encourage them, they're going to talk to them, or they might think that the student is being defiant, doesn't want to work. Mm -hmm. How would you coach them to work with students like that, the SPED students in particular, who after you've given instruction, after you've you know, given directions, they just sit there and almost refuse to work? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question and a, a really common behavior that, that we see. Um, so there's, there's really three pieces to kind of looking at that. Um, the first one that I always start with is I go from the assumption that there is a skill deficit around whatever behavior that we're seeing. So um, there is something that they're not able to do that's stopping them from doing the work. That doesn't mean they can't do the work. When I look at a skill deficit, I'm talking about something like it might be um, the skill may be completion of non-preferred work. So that's that's a skill that they are not able to look at something that they don't like and make themselves do it anyway. So um, that that's going to be my first step is like, let's look at what actually is going on along with that kind of what's the reason for the behavior or the function? Why are they doing that? What are they getting out of it? Um, and then when we have a kind of a guess on that, because we don't really know until we jump in a little bit, once we have a guess, then we're going to do some reinforcement around that particular behavior. So for example, I would coach um, a teacher because I would first assume that there was some compliance issues. I would look at that behavior as kind of a compliance issue. And so I would help them set up a really simple um, reinforcement program just specific to that one behavior that every time they were given an instruction to get to work, anytime they did that, they earned whatever this really reinforcing reinforcement was. And, um, so we can start to see if that then motivates the student to be able to do it. What we might find out is, wow, you know what? We thought they understood how to do it, or we thought they were understanding the instruction, but really they weren't, or a whole, a whole group of other options, but that's how we would know. Um, and oftentimes, a good percentage of the time, we'll see that once we set up that reinforcement system that's really connected correctly to the behavior, that students turn around. 
Awesome. Yeah. I, when I see a student not wanting to work, there are a lot of reasons. I mean, yes, maybe they don't want to do the work, but more often than not, I found that they don't really understand what to do right. and they want to save face. So right. they just sit there and make it seem like they're being defiant when actually, you know, they wouldn't act, even mind doing the work or they'd yeah. like to attempt it, but they don't know where to start. Right. Right. And it's just been, it's, it's, it's easier and feels better to, to not do it than to do it and then feel like they're not smart enough to do it. So I've worked in co-teach and in collab before, and we're going to talk more about those models, but I've heard a lot of gen ed teachers in terms of their myths or biases. And, um, I'm curious what you've heard, like generalizations that people have made about SPED students that aren't necessarily true. I think the biggest um, myth that I see is, or the, the biggest misconception that I see is that the kids are doing whatever they're doing just to be quote unquote bad, or they um, you know, are just trying to get away with something or whatever other reason, but that there's this, um, intentional reason for them to be able to do it as opposed to that there's a disability and they're actually struggling with that. Again, I see this most often with, um, kids with behaviors, both, you know, emotional disorders and ADHD kind of behaviors is that teachers feel like if they just tried harder, that they could be better, or if they were just, you know, parented better or a lot of other reasons. So I see that a lot. Um, and I think that that, um, often will impact the way that they work with those kids. Um, I think really getting in touch with our own understanding of how we are thinking and feeling about the kids is important because it really impacts the way that we interact with them. Um, and I, the other common thing I see is teachers really feeling like um, these kids shouldn't be in general ed, mm -hmm. that if they can't fit in, then they shouldn't be there. And that, of course, is always really upsetting because I'm, um, you know, I, I certainly I come from a special ed background. And at the same time, I do believe that there are times where a small group setting is better for kids. I mean, there I, I you know, there are different options. That's why special ed so awesome is there's so many different options. Um, but that idea that just because they don't um, fit in exactly, then they shouldn't be there or it's too much for too, too much to be asked of a teacher to do. And that, you know, that's always a little bit bothersome because I, you know, we all go into teaching to help kids and we don't, you know, we don't get to necessarily pick and choose which kids those are that we help. So, um, but again, I really do so much of the time it comes back to the idea when you, when you really get down to it with teachers, it's because they feel like failures when they're working with these kids because they just were not given the skills and the tools. And so I think when we feel like we're failing, you know, our first, our first response is to kind of want to get out of it. Right. And I, and I understand because I've had classes obviously where I've had sped kids and then gen ed classes like not accelerator or anything where i just have regular kids and the comment that i hear the most is that these students are low right. which is really infuriating to me because yeah. actually quite a few of them are brilliant they mm -hmm. just like you mentioned have a learning disability it just takes them longer or they have to get there a different way and so, as you had mentioned, some teachers feel like they don't belong in my classroom. If let's say that they are lower. Well, how about your non IEP students that are right. lower? What are right. you going to do with them? Are you going to go put them somewhere else too right. because they don't quote unquote fit in? What does fit in really mean? I have just as many. I actually have more behaviors in yeah. my gen ed class than I did in my co-teach class. So I, I feel like these misconceptions are I feel like they really taint how they see the kids in their classrooms as well. And it's really unfair to those kids because I feel like they're not getting a fair shot in the minds of their teachers. Right. No, I, I totally agree with you. And so often when I go in to do um, observations for teachers that I'm coaching and I always will tell them if, if they're calling me to help out with a particular student, I'll always say, don't tell me which student. 
that you're, you know, struggling with. I want to just be able to kind of get a feel. And at least over half the time, the kids that they're actually concerned about are not the ones that are actually causing, you know, more of a disruption to their class. And those are often general ed kids because with special ed comes a lot of support. And so special ed kids oftentimes have a lot more support than the general ed kids who are more, um, you know, who are on the borderline. And mm-hmm. th- those are the kids that I think oftentimes, you know, struggle the most. But um, it, it is very interesting. But in that teacher's mind, they know this kid is special ed. And so they are focused on that. But you know, then I'm able to point out like, but look what's going on over here. This may actually be more of a concern to you. This may actually be what's causing you a little more frustration. But if we put in place this system, that's going to get at both of those issues. So um, I I think that, you know, as a teacher, you hear special ed, as a general ed teacher, oftentimes you hear special ed and you just, you immediately are, you know, you have an idea of what's coming through your door, whether that be true or not. And I think that low thing that you brought up about, you know, kids being low, um, that's an interesting issue um, because I work with teachers across kind of the spectrum of socioeconomic districts. And that's such a, a big issue um, in higher performing and higher socioeconomic districts. The, the, the bar is so high and there's no room for kind of average that um, the teachers feel all this pressure that all of their kids perform at such a high level that kids who are even in the average range are kind of targeted as low. Um, and that's really concerning or for sure any kids who, you know, learn differently or need a little extra time or need it, you know, done a different way immediately kind of get put in the same bucket. Right. And it's not fair to those kids because you're you're kind of prejudging them. Yeah. Um, I like to just see kids as clean slates. Sometimes th- there are times when I don't even want to see if they have IEPs and see if I can mm-hmm. figure it out on my own. But yeah. at the same time, I know it's a disservice to not really look at the, the files ahead of time. So I know right. how to support them. Um, so if I am a brand new gen ed teacher, how can I help out my students case carriers? Well, I think that, okay, so there's a couple pieces to that. Um, Communication is the most important because the uh, special ed teachers, case carriers, you know, how um, case managers, whatever they're called at the schools, um, obviously they have many, many students across multiple different classrooms, um, often across different grade levels with different abilities. They have kids who have a modified program. They have kids who have an accommodated program. They kind of, um, have the whole, the whole group. And so, um, it's very hard for those teachers to be able to keep up with everything that's going on in every single classroom. And so the more that, um, you can communicate and set up a system for the special ed teachers. It's so great. Um, I love when I see a team at a school where they have it set up that, you know, every Friday, the general ed teacher sends an email. This is what we're going to be doing next week. These are the things, you know, I can give you this, this is where we can work on that. And the special ed teacher can then just come and and support and get that ready for the students. That's wonderful. Um, So that's super helpful. Um, another thing I think is really helpful is that if a general ed teacher is struggling or has concerns that they go directly to the special ed teacher or the case carrier, um, and not sort of a roundabout way, which, which often happens, um, that they go to them and share their concerns, whether that be, they don't feel like the student's getting enough support or, or whatever, whatever it is, but that they go directly to the special ed teacher. A lot of times, um, special ed teachers report that, that, you know, they hear a lot of things through sort of the lunchroom and not directly from those teachers. And, you know, people are willing to do what they can to make things work, but they need to know that that's, that that's going on. So I always encourage that piece of communication. Now, how can they help out with, you know, in terms of like collecting work or things to help you out in terms of writing goals and the, and with the IEPs? Well, for many of our kids, uh, many special ed kids who spend the majority of their day in general ed, it really is the general ed teacher that's going to be able to provide all of that data for writing goals um, because the special ed teacher will not have as much access. But so I think that um, 
you know, best case is that there's a data collection system in place and that they're willing to use that when they're doing their informal assessments with the special ed kids. So um, I, you know, I try and help teams put that together, a system that works for them. And oftentimes it's as easy as um, all of the IEP goals on one page with just some boxes to be able to put, you know, yes or no, whether they're meeting that goal. And that really helps the special ed teacher be able to monitor that on top of the informal assessment that they'll be doing. Speaking of assessments, I seem to have encountered two different camps with teachers. So there are the teachers who almost don't want to grade at the same standard that they do with the regular ed kids. And so they just kind of like either modify the assignments or lessen the amount of work or just kind of grade them really easy because they're thinking, okay, the student is low. They wouldn't do that for their gen ed students, Mm -hmm. but they'll do it for the SPED. And then the student, it looks like they have an A in the class. Mm -hmm. Uh, And then now mom and dad don't think that they need services. On the other end of the spectrum are teachers who grade them exactly the same. Mm -hmm. And so they let the student fail if the student is failing. Not that they didn't help them, but, you know, if a student is at a D level or an F level, that's what they get. But then they get pushback from the parents or there's just some kind of, you know, fallout from failing a SPED student. So what what's your take on either one of those? Well, I'll tell you my my take on failing a SPED student is that that anytime a SPED student fails, that's on us, because that means that we haven't um, met some of their needs, even if it's behavioral or motivational. Um, And I get, you know, especially when you get kids into high school, they often, you know, they just stop doing the work and they don't want to do it anymore. And there's a whole kind of history with that as well. But um, I think that that anytime a student is at that level, then that's on us because we need to figure out how to support that student to be not failing. So that, that I think it is really a problem. That's a red flag to me right away. If, if a student is in a teacher's class and they're failing everything, it means something is not being done. We're not providing support. That teacher isn't accommodating in a way that's meaningful for that student. Something needs to happen. And that's where I recommend that, you know, an IEP is called pretty quickly and we look at goals and we look at services and we make sure that everything's on target. Um, The flip side is obviously making everything easy. And we see this a lot. And then um, parents don't have a clear understanding that the the child is not meeting or near grade level standards because it doesn't look like they are. Um, So that's not the way we want to go either. I think, you know, kind of the... um, the golden spot is that a student gets the accommodations that they need um, per the IEP, and then they should be able to um, perform at a level similar to their peers because that's what the IEP is for. Um, And if they're not, then we as a team need to come back and look at what's going on. So if we have accommodations in place and they're being used and the student is still struggling, then we need to figure out what's going on. Right. So maybe they're placed in the wrong class. Maybe at that point, gen ed isn't a good place for them if, despite all of these supports, they're still really struggling. Right. Or maybe there's, um, you know, some skills, some holes that they we didn't know they had. And so they're really struggling. So say they're in math and, and we, you know, didn't know that they really didn't know facts A, B, C, and D. And so now that's showing up because the content's gotten harder. So we might need to go back, write some new goals, maybe do some pull out to be able to teach those particular skills and figure out what's going on. But I mean, you know, being a teacher in general is like being a detective, and but being a special ed teacher even, even more so. So every time we start to see sort of a red flag, then it's really our responsibility to come back and figure out what's the reason for it. Why is that happening? So for my fellow gen ed teachers, I hope you found the information that Brandy shared useful. She definitely affirmed some of what I've already experienced and know while also shedding light on some new things. As a new teacher, I know that you can definitely use so much of what we discussed today in your teaching. 
Now, you don't want to miss out on next week's episode where Brandy and I deep dive into issues that SPED teachers have. So, you know, even if you're a gen ed teacher, this can open your eyes to the struggles that your fellow SPED teachers have, as well as put into perspective the complexities of their job. So be sure to come back next week for episode 98. You don't want to miss it. And if you have any questions about what Brandy and I discussed today or just questions in general about teaching, you can reach me at Kim at TeachersNeedTeachers.com. Have a fabulous week. Thanks for listening to the Teachers Need Teachers podcast. Love this episode? Head over to Apple Podcasts or Google Play to subscribe, rate, and leave a review.